I'll just welcome all of you and I'll, I'll just welcome everyone and um, and so glad that we're here. I think we may have a few more people coming as we move along, Kim. I think there's some others that had said that they were going to attend today, but um, thank you, Nancy, for being here. And it's just great to have you and Catherine for um, being part of the program and Jamie as always for uh, helping us to organize this. It's just wonderful. And Susan for um, having this great idea. So um, with no further ado, Jamie, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Lorna. And hi, everyone. It's great to see you today. Um, I'm Jamie Austin, an SF NIMWA honorary member and also director of exhibitions and public programs at CCA. And let me just let someone in here. Um, and I have a distinct honor to moderate this series of virtual studio visits that we have been doing since the pandemic as a way to really keep the group connected um, both to each other and to artists. So I would also like to thank Lorna and Kim and Robin and Susan for your support of this series and this particular event. Um, and for those of you who were able to join, it was really exciting to be able to attend an event in person a few weeks ago at YBCA. Um, and yeah, that was just such a special moment to uh, be able to see people face to face. But I'm glad that we can also continue these virtual studio visits. Today's event features a presentation by artist Nancy Yodelman, followed by a conversation between Nancy and SF NIMWA's first woman to watch um, artist, Catherine Vetney, who will also be sharing some of her recent work. Um, this conversation will be followed by a Q&A with the larger group. So all of you are welcome to ask questions um, at that point in time. So thank you for being here. And now I would like to welcome Susan who will introduce Nancy. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And I'm um, so thrilled to be introducing Nancy Yodelman. Uh, Nancy has had an amazing five decade career in art uh, so far. And uh, she started in 1970 as one of 15 students in Judy Chicago's uh, feminist art program at Fresno State. And she then went on to go, go to LA and be part of Miriam Shapiro's Woman House. Um, and, and while there managed to be artistic consultant for a Rolling Stones concert. So, <laughs> and she got her, got her MFA from UCLA um, and has been an art teacher for 20 years, recently retired. She has been awarded grants from the Pollock Krasner Foundation the Adolf and Esther Gottlieb Foundation and the Tree of Life Foundations. And her work is in the Brooklyn Museum, SF MoMA, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So I'm really thrilled that she is showing at the Fourth Wall Gallery and that she's agreed to be here. And thank you, Jamie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you for moderating and thank you, Catherine, for being the panelist. And thank now we'd like to welcome Nancy to give her presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Susan, for your little introduction and also for having the ha having the exhibit of my work and Jamie and everybody and Lorna uh, for doing this today. I'm really, really honored to be able to do this. So I'm going to start in with my, um, whoops, let's see, I'll get it started at the beginning and I'll, I'll do the screen share. Let's see. Oh, wait, um, screen share. Oh, here, share a screen. Okay, and this is what I want to share. And here. Okay, and I'm going to press play. I've been thinking so much about Judy Chicago lately and my background, uh, partly because I was up for Judy's reception at the De Young, which is an amazing show. And I've been reading her newest autobiography and I owe so much to Judy. And I'll, I'll touch on that as I move along through this. So this was Judy and I in 2013. She's always been extremely supportive of me and my work and just a very good mentor and friend also. So first of all, the show is at, at um, Pearl Tree and other works at the fourth wall. There's one more Saturday left 
this October 30th. If you haven't seen it yet and you're able to go, that'd be great. Here's just a little shot of the gallery with some of the work that's there. This is Pearl Tree, the piece called Pearl Tree. I'll talk about it at the, at the end. I'll talk a little bit more about it, but you can see the scale with people in the gallery. Another piece in the exhibit, Oak Vessel. I've often been asked if this is bronze. I do a lot of what's called faux bronze with paint, although I have worked in bronze. This is one of my favorite works, a tiny baby, baby dress with cork oak leaves. And, and anyway, it's at the gallery. I also use a lot of um, vintage, these are buttons, pins, rhinestone, um, tiny baby dress relief that's also at the gallery. So precious. One thing I just absolutely love is vintage kitchen utensils. I have a huge collection of them. I love to work with them. This one was first wrapped with hair from my hairbrush and then a lot of pearl necklaces and waxed cord. And then it has a layer of encaustic over it. So I like to work with a lot of different materials. I'm showing this image because, well, I love this image of myself. I was about maybe 22 or 23 years old. I was very intense, very serious, but also so it looks so innocent to me, that face. One thing Judy taught us was to use great good equipment. So I had previously was using little cheap cameras. This camera, I remember my mother bought it for me. It was a Pentax. I took it everywhere. Wherever there was a mirror, I would I'd take a self-portrait. So so when I met Judy, it really completely changed my life. I met her when I was 21 in 1970. And here, I love this photo of her because she looks so tough, but she's actually got a very tender inside. <laughs> and this was when she first changed her name. When I first had her for a teacher, she was actually Judy Garowitz. She changed her name, picked her own name, Chicago, the man standing outside the boxing ring was her dealer, Jack Glenn. And this was an exhibit for um, a show she was having and some of her very powerful work. She went to auto body school, learned to paint like that. So in her class, there were 15 women. At the time, 1970, it was extremely unusual to separate a class by gender. She insisted on it and she insisted we rent a space off campus. It was huge, the cavernous building. And she insisted that because at the time, 1970, I'm 73 years old and my generation in a class, if there were men in the class, the women, the men would talk, the women would be quiet. It just, it's the way it was. So she sense that and she it was brilliant that she separated by gender brilliant so inside the studio i have very few images this was from a color slide i have no idea what i was doing i'm the one bending and one of the other students is standing near me but we had this huge space and i made a huge costume shop i had just take previously taken classes in costume and makeup and, and Judy just encouraged us to really um, like do work from our experience. So I'm going to show a little video clip of Judy talking here. It was filmed by SF MoMA in 2010. It comes up in just a second. What I wanted to do was I wanted to encourage my students to do what I was then going to try and do in my own work, which was peel away the um, formal prohibitions to my own content. But of course, they didn't have them yet because they hadn't professionalized like I had. So they didn't have the same level of prohibition against their own content. And as soon as I gave them permission and a context, it was like 
taking the lid off of a boiling pot. The other really <laughs> thing that I remember about this, if I can find it, is the Kant cheerleaders. The, my students were very exuberant. And one time we had a visit from the theorist, T. Grace Atkinson. And she came to the Fresno airport and my students Hello. got themselves up in these costumes, uh -huh. these cunt leader <laughs> costumes. And they did cheers at the Fresno airport as T. Grace got it's off the uh, plane, much to the consternation of a convention of Shriners who were descending from the same plane. And I, of course, was like, oh my God. I mean, I'm a middle-class Jewish girl. And I was trying like not to share my chagrin with my students because I didn't want to inhibit them. But at the same time, it was like, oh. But now it's become a historic picture, you know. <laughs> so Judy, really, I mean, it's amazing. I had no idea that she was feeling exactly like that when we were at the airport, but she was so encouraging and we were very enthusiastic. And here's the outfits with the big felt letters. We were trying to make the word, um, like take away the stigma of the word. It, it actually didn't really work, but for us it did at the time it did and this was 1970 so we also did a lot of collaborative costume images it was really my idea and i had that costume whole section in that huge cavernous space and we would dress up various students in the class and then judy was so encouraging with that she said get backdrop paper get you know use a better camera she insisted that we push the image. And here's one. I'm only showing a couple of these. We have many, and they've been shown in Paris and all over. I mean, they're kind of uh, whatever. Now, this was called, this is something we did in the spring. We called it Rap Weekend because if you think back, if you, if you were an adult in the 70s, the word rap just meant talk, like get together and talk. It didn't, it didn't have anything to do with music. So we invited, it was our studio in Fresno, we invited a lot of, and it was all women, invited women from Los Angeles uh, to come. And that's when Judy Chicago first got linked with Miriam Shapiro. Miriam, and we always called her Mimi. She wanted us to call her Mimi. She was an amazing person and just, you know, a lot of stuff I learned from her, like uh, working with fabric. And um, I mean, I owe a lot to both Judy and Mimi there. Um, you can see her, that big painting, it's called Ox. That's what she was doing before she really got into that whole idea of feminist art. And then how her work changed, she started using a lot of fabric. She had a, I remember being so impressed, she had a patron who owned a fabric store in Santa Monica and she could just go and pick out bolts of fabric and, um, and to do these amazing, this is a large painting. So Mimi was going to be teaching at Cal Arts. It was a brand new school and Judy got hired there. Also something wonderful she did, she asked me to dress her up. I had a huge collection of Victorian clothing because it was, you could buy a box of it for a dollar back then, nobody wanted it. So I dressed her up and I know she loved that photo because she used to use it in catalogs when they asked for a portrait. So that's a wonderful thing. Now from there, from CalArts, we um, worked on this huge project, Woman House, maybe you've heard of it. Um, and a few quick facts. Okay, the buildings weren't ready. The school is a brand new school funded by Disney, um, but the buildings weren't ready. So it was suggested that we find an old house and fix it, fix up, do projects in it. Things like that hadn't really been done much. So it's a 17 room mansion in Hollywood. We got permission. It was slated to be torn down and it actually was torn down the, when we were done with it. So, but we worked so hard every day, all those broken windows. Um, it took several months, but it was an amazing project when um, 10,000, over 10,000 visitors came. And I remember Gloria Steinem came, Anna Ace Nin, the writer. It was phenomenal. There was an article in Time Magazine. It was actually called Bad Dream House because it really talked, you know, Judy did a bathroom that was the menstruation bathroom. And there were some, you know, just aspects of, 
uh, that anyway, the, the press loves to do that. So, and there was a film made, if you haven't seen it, it, it's a wonderful film that really, you get a very good idea of Woman House. And actually it's going to be in February, it'll be February, 2022, 50 years. So um, pretty amazing. So that was the house. It was huge, gigantic. But when I talk about the broken windows, it was a mess. There was no plumbing, no working toilets. We worked there every day, eight hours a day for several months and got it ready to do the rooms. And we each you know, worked on projects. So here's a few more photos. These are from Rutgers archives. So the room I worked on, we had read, we were reading women authors and Colette, a woman, a French author had written a book about a courtesan named Leah, Leah who was aging. And my friend, uh, fellow student, Karen Lacoque, we did Leah's room. And we also, we were able to go to the fabric store, Mimi's patron and pick out all these laces and silks. And we borrowed antiques from Melrose Avenue, which wasn't very far. And then the performance was done in the room of continually putting on makeup. Of course, we were young 20 year olds with perfect skin, but doing the, the makeup, but people would actually stand in the doorway and cry watching it. It was very moving. It was amazing. So we did a lot of performance all directed by Judy. She has a real gift with working with performance. And that's just, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Woman House could be a whole talk unto itself, of course. But for me personally, when Woman House was done, I was so exhausted. I mean, just really spent. And I wanted to delve into work that was only mine. I remember that really strong feeling. And I started out, um, I was working with Mimi Shapiro and I told her, you know, I'd sewed all my life. My mother had been a seamstress as well as a registered nurse. And I really wanted to do that. And I, you know, and it, to me, it made perfect sense to work with buttons and fabric and, you know, how would a woman's work be different from a man's work it, for me at the time. And this was 72 doing that. I also did, I did a whole bunch of these, maybe about a dozen, I called them bonnets, which in the costume and makeup class, I had learned to do life casting. So these were life casts of my face. And I learned, I found real glass eyes at a place in LA downtown anyway. And so um, and this was a photo taken not that long ago. These have been very well preserved, which is amazing. They were shown twice in New York City and different uh, a surrealist show and another show. Um, and so I worked, I'm going to run through these a little bit quicker. I worked a lot with fabric and clothing. And I called this Lucy's coat because that photo said Lucy on it. And then here, this is jumping a little bit ahead. Um, working with mainly relief, meaning they hang on the wall, faux bronze. It's not exactly bronze, but it's painted to look like bronze. And this had a little bit of humor, the name cocktail armor, like you could wear this to a cocktail party. Well, not really, but I mean, that was the idea. When I got a, a couple of grants, it was 204. 2005 and 2007, the Pollock Krasner and the Gottlieb grant, I was able to do work in bronze. I also had a new nice studio. I like these little bones because, I uh, twigs, because they look like little bones. And here's another relief in bronze. And then this shoe is at the gallery right now. It's an edition of nine where I, anyway, and it's actually weighs about 10 pounds. It's very substantial and bouquet. I didn't even know if this was possible, but it was casting um, flowers, actually making a mold from dried flowers and it worked. So my studio, I'll go through these quickly. I have a long, narrow lot. I live adjacent to Fresno in a town called Clovis, and this is the best studio I've ever had. 
and there's a side view. And I work on these high tables. When I was younger, I worked on the floor. Now the height, you can see the shells. These are shells for the, the pieces are mainly uh, castings of dresses, great windows. So just how I do it, okay, using plaster bandage first over the dress and then a harder setting plaster on top. This is another piece that's flipped. So you see the inside and here some, and then this piece, uh, I call it memento. It's not bronze, so it's mixed media. It's very light, but it's painted to appear bronze. I used a lot of photos from my life, like one down at the bottom sitting at my father's grave and pictures as a baby. A favorite series of mine, I call it embellished because I went kind of berserk buying broken rhinestone jewelry on eBay. I found someone who sold it by the pound. There's something to me so poignant and bittersweet about broken costume jewelry. It, it twinges something inside me. It's hard to explain. Also around in 2014, I had cataract surgery and all of a sudden color became just amazing, the, especially blue. This is called Evening. And this is one of my favorite works. And it has, um, I'll show you what I really love is when some of the stones are knocked out because that that's really what moves me, what makes me um, feel, um, it's like a longing for something that's lost, but wonderful at the same time, if, if that makes any sense. So I have more part of the embellished and I did a lot of boots. This has more kitchen utensils, a pastry cutter tucked in. This piece is at the gallery and just different shades of color. I love doing, I had so much of that jewelry. I could sort by color. I could sort by all kinds of stuff. Potato masher with a doll. And here, this, the language of lace. I really like that name because I felt like it was speaking to me. And here, pearl tree. I just want to say a few more words about, I had a plant that died and it was a plant called yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And it was unusual because it would have three different colors at the same time. It would start out white. No, it started out purple, it fade to lilac, and then white blossoms, the same blossom. So it would be all these different colors at the same time. And when it died, I was just so sad. And so I saved it and I, I painted it with this thick um, stuff. I, I beefed it up with wire and I started wrapping it with, with pearl necklaces, tons of pearl necklaces. Once again, that, that, um, memento from the past. And I just think, I just love the way the branches look um, with the pearls. And it's kind, it kind of moves too, but because it has all the wire. So let's see, I think this is the last slide. So I'm just gonna just click, it goes there and we'll stop the share and here and I'll close that up and okay, let's see. And Nancy, thank you, that was amazing. I can't believe you boiled down, you know, 50 years of content <laughs> into 20 minutes um, for that overview for everyone. That's so generous of you. Oh, you. Um, I hope I wasn't talking too fast, but I <laughs> just wanted to. No, and if there's anything folks want to see again, certainly that's what the Q&A, you know, and some of that section is um, at the end. But that was such a great foundation that we'd love to build a conversation on top of. And, you know, just thinking, you know, and looking at your work and also um, at Catherine's work um, as well. You know, one word that really just sticks out to me for both of your works is, is transformation, um, and thinking about transformation of materials, but how that can also, you know, maybe transition into transformation of self. Um, so we'll pin that. 
But, um, you know, we're really excited to welcome you into the group and have you in conversation with some of, you know, with an artist who the group, um, you know, supports. And so I would like to welcome Catherine into the conversation and she's going to start by kind of giving a little foundation of her work for you, Nancy, just a few um, images, um, as well as an update on what she's working on so that we can transition that into a conversation between the two of you. So Catherine, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Jamie, Nancy. That was, that was wonderful. I loved, um, I loved hearing more about your work and I have all kinds of questions for you. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you everyone for having me here today and organizing this and inviting me. Um, I'm just really looking forward to being part of the conversation. So um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I have a quick like five minute presentation. Um, many of you know my work pretty well. Um, but um, some of you might, might not know everything and Nancy doesn't know it that well. So I thought um, I would just do a quick presentation here. Um, hmm. Can you see the little slides on the side or is it like the big picture in a full screen? We can still, do you want to try hitting time. the button on the bottom? Is there to... a or... Yeah, let me try that. Did that, hmm, interesting. Oh wait, go go left or go um this one yes try that one yes okay there we go you'd think Perfect. i never shared something on zoom before um okay so um thank you again um i just wanted to start off really quickly with this piece so this is probably the first piece i made that sort of got me started um where i'm at now um it's a drawing of a Waterford crystal butter dish. Um, and I found this object from looking through online wedding registries that were listed under not my name, but belong to strangers. So other, mm -hmm. other Catherine V's out there um, picking their objects um, with their partners. And I was really fascinated by this, by this object, I was got really interested in Waterford Crystal as sort of this um, object that you you ask for in your wedding registries, and I couldn't get this butter dish out of my head. So it was one hundred and fifty dollars. I thought that was amazing. Um, I couldn't believe that just for a butter container, and um, I decided to go and buy it. So I did. I went to oops, I went to Macy's, and I bought this butter dish and I drew it from life in metal point. So I used a piece of gold. Um, on a specially prepared ground, um, and I drew it from life. Um, and in the center of the butter dish, I decided to sort of scramble the pattern. So if you look closely, you can see on the edges, the cut crystal sort of looks more realistic. And then towards the center, it kind of scrambles into some sort of melty, nonsensical pattern. So I was really interested in wedding culture at the time and the weddings as a sort of trope of femininity. Um, at the time, a lot of people in my life were asking me when I was going to get married. And, um, you know, luckily, um, people like Nancy and her colleagues um, <laughs> paved the way for the personal to be political. And so, um, you know, that became a little bit a legitimate jumping off point for artists to make work from. So that is um, a history that I feel like I'm really mining and, and many, many people are. That has definitely expanded way beyond feminism. I think that sort of phrase of the personal being political. Anyway, um, so after I made this piece and it looked like it was kind of melting, um, oh. I, the next step, step seemed to be to melt some actual crystal. So many of you are familiar with this installation. Uh, many of you really showed a lot of support for me in making it and I appreciate that. Um, this installation is called Guilty Pleasure and it's made from um, hundreds of pieces of melted Avon lead crystal. Um, so pitchers and bases and all kinds of things like that. Um, and I also let the, let the crystal really, I cranked up the kiln really hot and I sort of let it drip into the floor of the kiln and made these sort of puddles. Um, I then coated everything in silver nitrate. So it, it's a traditional way of making, turning glass into a mirror essentially. So these were clear when they came out and then 
the coding sort of transform them into a type of mirror, um, sort of a distorted mirror. Um, more recently, I'm still drawing and um, making sculptures with the crystal, um, but I've been adding some, sort of adding to my vocabulary of um, still life as it relates to tropes of womanhood and ideas about um, identity and the kind of objects that um, people sort of purchase and are consumed to sort of reinforce that identity. Um, so I've been really interested in Aramis scarves and I started noticing them um, during the Trump administration when um, uh, Louise Linton, who was the wife of the treasury secretary, whose name I'm forgetting now, um, was wearing one and she kind of got some um, pushback from that for, for wearing this expensive scarf um, at a time when people were really thinking a lot about class and um, all of the problems we were having. So I became really interested in the Aramis scarf as sort of this other um, symbol of aspirational and normative womanhood. Um, and I also wanted to add a figurative element. So I started playing with the addition of these sort of grabby, greedy hands sort of reaching towards um, these objects, these aspirational objects. Um, and then in some cases, the, the hands sort of ended up poking into the scarves. And in this case, I started thinking a lot about um, images of the doubting Thomas throughout art history, sort of um, poking into Christ's wound to see if he is real, if he is who he says he is. Um, so there's, that goes, I mean, there's a beautiful Caravaggio. Um, there's symbolism about this moment all through medieval texts. Um, so yeah, I, I was sort of thinking about how can I expand my vocabulary of tools? I, I love the crystal so much and I, I am, go very deeply into it, but I sort of wanted to expand my vocabulary a little bit. So that's where I'm at now. Um, and I have a um, solo exhibition coming up in the back room of Catherine Clark Gallery. Um, so that'll be November 6th through December 23rd. And I'm really excited. There's a lot of um, new sculptures and new drawings that feel very ambitious and were created in the last few months. Um, and I don't wanna to share too much cause I want it to be a surprise. I know many of you might see it. Um, but um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. And that's pretty much all I have to share. So I'm looking forward to chatting more with, with you, Nancy, and to hearing what questions Jamie has prepared for us. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for providing that overview and updating us all with what you're working on. And, you know, I, I've continued to think about, you know, transformation, but I also think, you know, one point that seems to connect Nancy and Catherine's work is, um, you know, using these tropes of womanhood as kind of a jumping off point, whether that's a kitchen utensil, um, you know, whether that's crystal that would be in a wedding registry, um, but then taking these materials and then transforming them to kind of reach at, you know, at new and wider meanings than what were in the original objects. And I was hoping you could maybe talk a little bit more about that. I'll ask maybe Nancy to start first, but you know, what kind of led you to looking at these tropes of womanhood as a jumping off point and then transforming them, um, you know, to have kind of a different meaning. Oh, yes. Okay. So um, can I go way back? <laughs> I mean, originally, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, originally when I, made a conscious choice to use clothing and fabric was because I had spent, I had sewed all my own clothes. I remember at six years old was the first time I used an electric sewing machine. I had been sewing by hand. So I was very young working with fabric and it was a, a love of mine. It was also a, in a way a limitation because in, I remember in junior high, they girls had to take sewing, sewing and cooking, and the guys could take shop classes. And I remember being upset by that. And I actually got talked into being allowed into the shop class. So they allowed a couple of the girls, I mean, we were girls or young women, 
And it was so wonderful to be able to laminate plaster, a plastic and cut it. But I think um, for me, it was very important to use when I made the conscious choice about, it's like how Catherine being fascinated with the Wedgwood crystal, um, Waterford, I'm sorry, what, I think Wedgwood is, those are plates, right? Dishes. Yeah, that's another one. I know one. my cousin had all that stuff. I remember yeah. thinking, ah, I don't want that. But anyway, <laughs> um, but that fascination and what it led you to, I'm just so, I just really, truly love your work. I feel mm -hmm. a real connection to it, especially uh, the slumped glass. I mean, you do call it slumping, right? The mm -hmm glass and the finish that that distorted mirror finish and the scarves oh my gosh I mean it's just and the hands are so beautifully drawn and you can see the pressure from the hands anyway I think I kind of might have got off the question but I'm just I get very almost viscerally connected with certain materials anyway that's I, that's my answer so you, Catherine, did you want to jump in and talk about, you know, transformation or kind of, I know you gave the backstory, but maybe how you think about the results that come when you're transforming these materials? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And um, Nancy, I love, I love how you put a lot of that. I think that what my original, what I was originally going to say was that I think that transformation is a point of critique you know, that, that sort of allows to open the doors and you think, well, how, how has this material been transformed? Um, and that can sort of, the way it's been touched and handled and treated can sort of help you maybe develop an understanding, even if it's just, just your own, of how to look at the piece and what kind of meaning to, to take from it. So I think transformation is... Um, how you open the doors to critique. At least that's how I do it in my work. Um, and, but I love Nancy, what you said about how, you know, there's, there's, I think there's a love of materials too. Like, I don't want to transform just any, any old material. It has to feel really special and it has to, it's kind of an emotional connection. I think that I make with materials and processes, Nancy, I don't know if you um, feel the same way. I, I feel in your work, there's there's so much care and um they're so detailed and I love the rhinestones with the gems coming off there's so much just thought and um and love for these materials and it's so interesting when you said your background is really in sewing and then you can now use all of that expertise in your work whereas if I wanted to make a dress I'd have to go learn how to do everything like I can't do much more than hem you know a pair of pants and so it's it's kind of interesting that you really your work really appropriates um, a, a skill that was sort of maybe forced upon you and other women in a way at the time. And you, but you really, really exploited that to make these beautiful objects. So I just think that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Catherine, for that. I'll maybe a question and feel free. You can you know jump in with others, but I'm curious, I mean, especially, you know, Nancy, as you showed us kind of this history, you know, starting at Fresno State and going to, you know, Woman House and work with Judy Chicago, but just, um, you know, in collaborative work and then moving into more, you know, independent work. But how has your understanding of the power and the role of feminism changed over time throughout your career? Well, it did change actually quite a bit in 1980 because I had a son in 1986 I had a daughter and I I was showing I was still I was working as an artist I was exhibiting I had a gallery gallery dealer then but it it changed quite a I, I don't know how to put it in words but it changed quite a bit having a family and being a mother but now um, I've been thinking back how things were and things have, have improved, but I remember being in an English class where the teacher told me in front of the class, he told me I was too pretty to be smart. And, you know, he got, he got away with it. And then he also, that same teacher would call me up and 
while everyone was working on a project, whisper nasty stuff in my ear and I'd be so embarrassed and I never told anyone about it because it was, I mean, today there's the me too. There, I mean, there's a lot of um, difference, but it was quite different when I was growing up. There weren't a lot of options. You could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, you could be a mother, I mean, Anyway, I'm not sure if I completely answered your question. Yeah, I think I mean that seems what some of the examples, like I'm thinking of maybe the cunt cheerleader example, you know, for yeah. example, was really, you know, pushing against, you know, some of that and also just trying to, you know, um, you know, to to retake, you know, like with language that maybe yeah, was typically used, you know, as Pretty as derogatory awesome. and empower and making that powerful for women. Yes, Judy often used that word and tried to use it in a positive sense. And for us, it seemed positive, but the rest of the world didn't really change in that regard. Right. Well, everything takes time, right? And I thought it was, you know, interesting. I think how, you know, Catherine was kind of um, alluding to being able to see the examples, um, you know, of projects like Woman House and then being able to use those to inform kind of her thinking about, you know, work and feminism. Catherine, I don't know if you want to maybe respond um, a little more about that or talk about how maybe, you know, kind of first wave feminism might have informed, you know, work and your thought process moving forward. Oh, well, um, let me think. Um, Oh yeah, we can have Catherine pop in and then think and we'll, um, yeah, and we'll, we'll, I want you to uh, yes. comment on that too. So Catherine should comment. Like, yeah, either way, I don't know. I'm interested. Um, I could really listen to you talk about this stuff all day, Nancy. Um, but um, yeah, I do. Yeah, I think that, you know, what was one thing that was, this is sort of reminding me of, um, is how when I was looking at your work, Nancy, I was thinking a lot about how um, in my experience in, in grad school, which was 2013 to 15, um, I got tons and tons of pushback, like you would, you know, um, for making work about my experiences, for making work about um, womanhood as well, a certain type of womanhood, right? Um, because not, I mean, I feel like there's as many definitions of womanhood as there are people who have a relationship to womanhood um, in the world, right? So I definitely feel like I'm very interested in a specific type. Um, of that. Um, but the question I wanted to ask you and the thing that I was wondering about is even, even in this era of 2013 to 15, I, you know, people were really like um, telling me that my work wasn't interesting because it was about my personal experiences. I felt oh, like no. people would, yeah, people would look at my work in a critique and they'd be like, oh, well, maybe you actually just really want to get married. I'm like, what? This, is, this is what I'm paying $30,000 for to hear, to hear what? this. So it's like, it was amazing because, you know, they, they couldn't talk about the worst. They would talk about me. And, um, I was just, so I made actually a lot of my work sort of fueled by this sort of pushback. And I think now, even a few years later, there's a type of feminism that has become more mainstream. I'm not sure Think things still happen, but at the even back then, just a few years, I was like one of the only person people in my class that identified as a feminist, and I got a lot of pushback from that. So I'm just a little curious about about you and sort of what has fueled your work, and maybe what that was like for you working also with craft techniques and thinking about this identity stuff and feminism. Um, I'm just curious what that was like for you. Well, see, I had a whole different experience. I had nothing but encouragement. And mm -hmm. even when I went to grad school at UCLA, um, nothing but encouragement, never had anyone say comments like I shouldn't be doing what I was doing. It was interesting. I don't know you know, maybe there, there was a point when I think people were thinking that feminist was, feminism was over, we didn't need it, you know, this mm -hmm. is we're beyond that, but I never, actually never experienced that. Wow. And I had, okay. especially when I was with, uh, had Judy and Miriam Shapiro as mentors, they were so encouraging. 
And they didn't give a ton of criticism, but the idea was to do what I wanted to do, what I instinctively felt I wanted to do. And a lot of my work ideas came from dreams, kind of super, what is it? Not supernatural, that's not the word, (laughs) subconscious. I would just, an idea would pop into my head and I would see it and I would make it. And I didn't really question it. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, because I don't know if I would have, especially at UCLA, I don't think I would have done well. Well, you know, it was kind of still like hippie period. There were a lot of the students smoking pot all the time. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I was too serious. (laughs) But there was this laid back attitude that was very different that I think that most people experience. Mm -hmm. I just say the 70s were when they talk about the 60s, the 70s were the 60s. I mean, it was like, oh, that's cool, man, kind of attitude, which I liked because I could do what I wanted to do. Yeah. I just wanted to do what I wanted. And I didn't, anyway, if that all makes sense. But I I think it must have been difficult, but maybe you use that. I know Judy and her past, she would use that to like, Mm -hmm. as momentum, it was like, you know, it could push you through something. So, and I think you were talking, I mean, how you, you know, your work was based on real life experiences and how maybe even the way that you approached or thought about it changed along with your experience of motherhood, which I know has been a theme in some of these other, you know, studio visits um, that we've had as well. So it does seem like these real life experiences are the starting point for a lot of the work that each of you are doing. I do want to make sure I could keep going with questions, so no pressure, but I do want to make sure that we include um, members from the group in the conversation as well. So if anyone has a question that they would like to ask. You are more than welcome to unmute yourself and jump into the conversation with a question or a statement. Um, I'll give everyone a a minute for that. And if not, I'll keep going. Jamie, I have a comment if that's uh, a good time. Please, Mary. Uh, Listening to Catherine's experience at uh, SFAI uh, about how people reacted to her work. Um, I was in grad school a year later uh, and also at CCA, um, not SFAI, but um, I wasn't making overtly feminist work my first year, but I distinctly recall, and this professor is no longer there so that my um, feedback may have contributed to that, I don't know, but being told that I painted like a Marin housewife. Oh, and just gosh. to have, I know critiques are meant to, um, what's the word, to provoke and, and get you thinking about things. And I was making art about personal experience and um, eventually we had a great, um, feminist course called the F word. uh, And it was a much more supportive uh, room in terms of people of all ages and all experiences. But I cannot tell you how that struck me. I, I mean, I've heard since that your first semester is intended to tear you down in order to build you back up. But coming into grad school after so many years of uh, being away from academia, that was uh, really tough. And it sounds like if I had been smart enough to go in the seventies, instead of starting uh, a very, uh, the the only career I saw as an option, because of course I didn't dare to think I could be an artist. So not, I, after teaching school, then I, I became a flight attendant because that way I at least could see the world. That was my the, the most daring I dared to be. But it just is interesting that I might have had more support back then, although I don't recall that from undergrad either. But, you know, anyway, that's my comment. Oh my God. 
Thank you for that, Mary. And I mean, that was something that struck me for in Nancy in your presentation was just um, the supportive and creative space that you know was was fostered by Judy and and Mimi in in that. Um, yeah, I mean, that felt like that was so meaningful to you, and also just the kind of um, systems of support that we can develop for ourselves, both in a learning environment and outside of it. You know, as women, seem like that factored you know, really deeply um, into it. Do you want to talk at all, Nancy, about maybe mentorship or what, or that sort of um, environment where you felt like you could experiment and explore? Oh, yes. Well, I remember especially both Judy and Mimi were very generous people. They would, we could, they'd have us over to their studios. I remember Mimi fixing dinner for a couple of us. And but it was what I'm bringing that up. It was that kind of um, relationship that seems very different, <laughs> especially I'm just horrified that in um, Mary is here in, in, in the critique the someone saying you paint like a Marin house. I, I did hear of a theory. Yeah, that breaking you down. But um, I, for some people, I think that's just I, it doesn't work. I mean maybe for some people it would but um it may have made me so angry that i determined to prove that person wrong. wrong but nonetheless it was not um it was not a fun experience and it was in front of the whole class and it was not uh an empowering experience at all sorry i'm done yeah. yes it is. We're so glad you persevered, Mary. I think you've proven every everyone wrong a hundred times yeah. that way. So you should celebrate your successes and your continued work that that you've been making. Um, do others in the group want to ask a question? Well, I was just going to make a comment as well. And uh, Mary, sometimes I think when I hear comments like you experienced, it gives me um, in my mind the reason why women start to group together and start to talk about feminism and their own ideas and how to support one another because um you know sometimes we have that kind of treatment from the opposite sex so not all of them but some of them and especially um especially in our careers you know those that kind of experience so it's um and i think it's part of for me i love Catherine and Nancy's work because of the nostalgia. It's so much nostalgia for me. Um, I think of hers and my grandmother's with the crystal and the costume jewelry. And it's an era where there seemed this warmth and this love from your mother or grandmother or any other person close in your life. And maybe it's some of that that as we go forward, is missing for one big time we lose those people in our life because they were old we were younger and we lose them but then also how society changes over time so I think you bring that nostalgia back and for me um you know it really speaks to me for that reason it brings me to a really warm place in my um, heart I really agree with that nostalgic aspect. But the other thing that I've, I've noticed in both artists' work is Catherine takes something very fragile like crystal and makes it very strong and lasting. And Nancy does the same thing with her materials. <laughs> you know, we didn't really see a lot of the, uh, the uh, dried flowers that you use, uh, except on that one oak vessel but dried flowers and leaves that then you work with and make it eternal. Um, and I just think that's just a really interesting, I don't know if that enters into the whole feminist conversation, but taking fragile materials and making them lasting and, and strong is a really interesting correlation between the two. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. That makes a very good point. Yeah. Hey, career. That reminds me, I think Nancy's, I might have the title wrong, but I think it's Thorn Shoe, is it? Where it's like a child's kind of baby booty that's then been covered with rose thorns all around it. So I also think it's taking, I, yeah, like there's, um, I don't know that, I like that transformation of material and taking something that's kind of sweet and soft and cuddly and um, changing that on its heel a little bit too. Yes. And they're tiny little rose thorns. That's in the collection of the 
Brooklyn Museum now, that little, it's just tiny, but it's so powerful. Other questions and comments? This is a great conversation. All right, well, I know this flew by so quickly, but I do wanna keep us on time. And I'm not sure if um, Robin might have a few announcements about at least the, the uh, some upcoming events and that are happening uh, be, with the group. Before we did that, um, Jamie, I just wanted to make one comment. I wanted to welcome Shirley Parks here today. And um, thank you for joining us. I know this is your first um, meeting that you've attended. And so we're just all so happy to have you. And I hope you'll attend again and when we can meet in person. Lorna, thank you so much. It's really great to uh, start getting acquainted with faces and names. I'm delighted to be here. Christine Soupy's brought me on board. I know she's in Egypt right now or she would probably be on. So anyway, this has been an incredible hour and I look forward to many more to come. Thanks again. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, Robin, um, now we'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Well, of course, I want to thank Nancy, well, Jamie, of course, for always moderating, and Nancy and Catherine, such beautiful works that I have in my house here from both of you. Um, I think it's just exceptional how you both have commonalities, and um, it does bring me so much warmth and joy that Lorna also expressed looking at both those items. In fact, Catherine, I almost took a picture today of your sculpture and the, the, uh, the painting. <laughs> um, anyways, anyways, I just want to thank you all. Thank you all very much. Um, and I just want to remind you that our next event is November 9th at Lorna's uh, from 4, 4, 30 to 6, 30. Um, and we're welcoming the new NIMWA International Advisory Board and uh, Eileen Gutman will be there, and Susan Fisher Sterling, Lucy Buchanan, and the Nimwa, Nimwa Board Trustees Chair, um, Winton Holiday. So hopefully you can all join us there. And I just want to thank everyone so much for this fabulous event. Thank you. Let's do a little round of applause. We can unmute and cheer and thank Nancy and Catherine and oh. everyone in the group for their work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jamie. Great. Catherine, Nancy, it's great. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Susan, too, for organizing. It was a great idea. Thank you, everyone, so Bye. much. Bye. 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 Thank you, Nancy. Susan.